Before we get to the video, I made a discord, so be sure to join the club. Last time in Balkan Civilizations, we talked about the Dacians, the people of the weird swords and long beards. Today we are covering their Greek cousins, the Thracians. The Thracians came to the Balkans 5,000 years ago and they settled on what we would call Bulgaria. There was no united Thracian kingdom for most of their existence, but they had a common culture that borrowed traits from others, especially Greece. Thracian tribes were in constant competition with each other for land and resources. This made the Thracian men very strong and well trained in combat. Thracian warriors were hired all over the region and Greeks were particularly fond of them. Greek historian Herodotus described the Thracians as one of the strongest civilizations in the world if they only united. The strongest of the Thracians were the Odrysians, who also attempted to create such unity among Thracians, even though it was short-lived. Let's have a look at the timeline. Thracians have their first appearance in the vast of warriors during the Trojan War, obviously this cemented their reputation as such. Greeks described them as ginger, but that's probably not true. Chances are they were dark bearded white and like their Dacian cousins, but uh, probably with um, curly hair this time because of the Greek influence. Speaking of which, there were a lot of Greek city-states in Thracia. Starting from the 8th century, a lot of them started to come up along the coast. They bonded a lot through trade and exchanged a lot culturally speaking. For example, the Greek god Dionysus is actually of Thracian origin. Thracian goods were far from unpopular in the Greek markets, particularly their wine. Thracians, unlike the Greeks, didn't have to water down their wine to enjoy it because it was that good. Thracians were also great metal workers and artists. When looking at Thracian society, we look at Herodotus once again. One thing we know maybe too much about is their stigma towards sex. For Thracian men, there was no such thing as monogamy. In fact, the Thracian men had from 10 to 12 wives. Virginity was basically worthless, culturally speaking, to Thracians. And if a man died with less than 6 wives, he would be considered a lonely and unlucky guy. And Rodotus also talks about the Thracians being numerous, so I guess they bred like rabbits. No wonder many of them decided to travel and become mercenaries. The Thracian warrior was called the Peltest. They were light infantry, equipped with javelins, a sword and a shield made out of sheep or goat skin, with a hole on the side, so it would be easier to throw javelins while wearing it. They were mostly skirmishers, but once they ran out of javelins, they were not to be underestimated on end to end combat. In 513 BC, Persia invaded the region and subdued most of the Thracian tribes living there. They were then hired by the Persians in later wars with the Macedonians and the Greeks. Thracians didn't suffer a lot from the occupation. On a similar way to the Greeks, it partly created a sense of solidarity among Thracians. Tribes fought a lot less and instead they watched each other's back against the smelly Persians. It was even during this time that a new intellectual movement was born called the Kitastai. They were essentially the deviants of Thracian society, the philosophers if you will. They thought that the best way to live was in complete solitude and not even interacting with anything alive, so they only hate things that, that, that were never alive and they also could not have intercourse of any kind of relationship. This was thought to be the key to gain godly status and normal people gave them the benefit of the doubt. In 470 BC, the Persians left, so the Thracians were left on their own devices. Didn't take long before Thracians started to look for a new authority. Here entered the Odrysians to fill the power vacuum. They established a kingdom that ruled over about 40 tribes and 10 small kingdoms. Relations and control over them varied greatly over time. In fact, the borders are, I think, a bit exaggerated. But we know for sure they existed and had a recognizable influence in the region due to their great relations with Macedon. Macedonian and Odrysian relations actually varied over time just as much. Up until Philip II, they actually had a balance 
Japan's rivalry. The first king was Teres I. He was a great conqueror and won many battles during the reign, but he ultimately died in the battlefield during a campaign against the Tribali. The Tribali were one of the least civilized Trajan tribes and they were never fully integrated with the Odrysians. They were also one of the first Trajan tribes to be influenced heavily by Celtic migrations later on in history, but I digress. Teres' son Citalsis was just as good in battle and also died by the hands of the Tribali. Yikes. The list of Thracian kings is long and messy, so I will only mention the ones that left a mark big enough to mean something. Citalsis is certainly one of them, since he allied with Sparta in the Peloponnesian War and invaded Macedon with an army of about 150,000 men. The number is a bit far-fetched, but it was probably not too far off since they retreated pretty early for lack of provisions. Relations with Athens were never too great, but things improved after the arrival of King Amadocus I in 410 BC, son of Citalsis. While foreign relations were doing well, internally speaking, the kingdom was showing the first signs of fragmentation. By the year 400, there was a civil war that split the country in three parts. The original dynasty lived, uh, lived on in the northern kingdom. Nothing much really happened until 353, when King Philip II of Macedon decided to invade Thrace. The two lower kingdoms fell to his might, but the third, under King Teutis III, lived on, probably as a client state. Relations were actually not that bad up until the era of Alexander the Great, when he appointed Lysimachus a governor of Thrace. When Alexander the Great died, he became the de facto ruler of Macedon in 323. BC, and relations only got worse from there. Regardless of the tension, Ceutis III was able to build the first city in Thrace called Ceutopolis and made it the capital. Things were going great for the Odrysians up until 281 BC when the Celtic migration arrived and they sacked the city. It was a big blow for the Thracians, but they teamed up with the Macedonians and other powers in the region, and by 212 BC, they managed to kick out the Celts out of Thrace. Race. These Celts inhabited the kingdom of Tylus in the south and they all left for Anatolia where they made the kingdom of Galatia. Some Celts stayed behind however, like the Scordisci who lived in the northwest with the Tribali in relative harmony with other Thracians. From here on, the Rodrigian kingdom kept on losing influence in the region until they became too dependent on Macedon. At the Battle of Pydna, Macedonia and Thrace lost to Rome and they were annexed by the Republic. It took some time for the Thracians to understand that. They attempted countless times to fight back or to have even a bit of representations. The Odrysian dynasty lived on in uh, all of this, but eventually they were fully Romanized all thanks to the central authority and political schemes by Augustus, and Thrace, and Thrace became a Roman province in 46 AD. Oh well, this was a long ride, I hope this video was worth the wait. Thank you a lot for watching, remember to like and subscribe, and I will see you next time with a brand new video.